and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world that knows sharing is caring. I'm Jake Mintz. That's Jordan Schusterman. And if you're going to make the playoffs, you have to let your opponent make the playoffs too. That's just protocol. It's nice. As we record this at 7.50 p.m. Eastern time on Monday night, both the Mets and Braves are doing something we were not so sure they would be doing when we recorded 24 hours ago. Would they have time to pop bottles if they successfully split this doubleheader, ensuring both of them a spot in this year's postseason field? Or would they book it to the airport ASAP with the Braves needing to get to San Diego and the Mets needing to get back to Milwaukee after they were just there yesterday? But no, they're popping bottles, Jake Mintz. And the Mets are the ones to thank because after winning the first game, they swung at everything under the sun in game two, ensuring that it ended in two hours and 14 minutes, a brisk pace for a baseball game. It felt faster Even nowadays, that. it felt it did. way faster than two. 214 is honestly not that notable in, in the pitch clock era, but it felt like we were zooming by. Okay, so but what let's is this podcast? Focus. Yeah. Yeah, let's Let's, focus on the good, please. Please. Let's focus on the good. Please. All right. Here's the deal. We witnessed one of the most unforgettable baseball games we have seen. That was a delight. Game one of the two games set between Atlanta and New York. Win and you're in. Lose and you got to win the next one. The Arizona Diamondbacks sitting at home, cheering on whoever uh, wins game one to sweep so that they can sneak into the playoffs. Game one, we are given Spencer Schwellenbach for the Atlanta Braves against Ty Lore McGill for the New York Mets. And the thought at the time is that both teams are throwing the less good pitcher available so that they could save said pitcher for a playoff series. Schwellenbach, just freaking I mean, unbelievable. What a a performance. And by the way, If the Braves are able to extend their season to the point where Spencer Schwellenbach can throw again, I hope we get to talk about him more than honestly we probably are going to right now. But what he has become for this team this season is an astonishing achievement for (laughs) a rookie starting pitcher, not to mention this performance that he delivered in the spot after he just did it to this team less than a week ago, right? To do it in consecutive starts against the same opponent is so impressive, uh, not to mention the pressure. So Schwellenbach, I don't know if we'll see him pitch again this season. Maybe we will if the Braves can keep it going, but wow, what a showing. Ozzie Albies, early two-run homer on a truly horrendous middle-middle curveball from Tyler McGill, which is notable because Ozzie Albies, as we've said, traditionally a switch hitter, right now is only hitting from the right side due to a hand injury. Facing Tyler McGill from the right side goes yard. Quick, uh, quick note on that. Um, it's a it was a left wrist fracture for Albies, and I'm I'm intrigued by the fact that he's more comfortable swinging right handed when he has a one handed finish from the right side with his left hand. I know the top hand is important for hitters, and it, but I I just. Visually, I'm I'm intrigued by that. But ultimately, the reality is Ozzy Albies is a way better hitter from the right side. And we saw him have two massive swings in this game from the right side uh, facing right-handed pitching. Well, fast forward to the top of the eighth. Enough pitching for Spencer Schwellenbach. He gets pulled from the game. And Brian Snicker, the Braves manager, opts to go with his high leverage individuals, his A relievers, in this spot. Yes, Braves are up three nothing. Right, we get a we get a little Loriano uh, home run in the sixth, and so the Braves are up three to nothing, and they have this bullpen that has been one of the best in baseball this year, right? And this closer in Iglesias, and they got all these other guys, and so uh, top of the eighth, you know, Tyron Taylor's coming up, and after he allows uh, Tyron Taylor a leadoff double, as you mentioned, Schwellenbach goes out, and here comes Joe Jimenez, and then is when things start to get very, very interesting. <laughs> Double, so, single, yes. single, mm-hmm. single, tie ball game. That's it. Double, single, single. In comes Rysel Iglesias, excuse me. Yep. Yep. Jose Iglesias, single, down the line, tie ball game. Mark Viento sack fly, Mets up one. 
Brandon Nimmo with a huge swing, a blast, an absolute yes. and <laughs> let's, monster shot. Let's pause on this moment here, right? Because the one run lead at this point is still feels sketchy for the Mets. Um, not just because of their bullpen inconsistencies, uh, but you know, Atlanta's lineup has has not been awesome recently. So if they could extend this lead further as this inning was just, you know, careening down the trail, tra- you know, the, the railroad tracks, that would just be huge if they could add the additional runs. And you knew it was a big deal for Brandon Nimmo to hit this home run because Brandon Nimmo, of all people, this guy who books it to first base on a four pitch walk. He took his sweet time. This was oh. had to be the first time Brandon Nimmo has pimped a home run in his life. I, I honestly be. feel quite comfortable saying that. So it's six to three Mets. OMG. In comes. Not just because it's the Mets. We would be Not saying OMG anyway. Let's let's be very clear. This was this True. was OMG worthy regardless of the of the situational context. But then Aaron Bummer comes in and quiets things down and gets out of the inning. In the bottom of the frame, in comes Phil Maton. Hit by pitch, fly out, single, first and third, one out, play the trumpets. Eddie D out of the pen at home, trying to get a five. (laughs) They're not playing him for him (laughs) in his own mind, baby. He's playing him in his head, Jordan. Maybe that was a problem because Mm. in that first frame, Diaz was not sharp. He was duller than an, an, uh, an eraser. That's like a two out of 10 for me. He was duller than a long conversation with a boring person. Even one out of 10. All right. Keep the recap going. <laughs> All right. Okay. So he, <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, he's not sharp. And part of that is because he pitched uh, yesterday through 26 pitches, comes right back out, gets a grounder. Kelnick single. Michael Harris. Walk. I'm sorry. Are we going to zoom past Jared Kelnick pitch hitting against Edwin Diaz? <laughs> <laughs> I go mean, ahead. Go I mean, ahead. I'm just I just want to I just want to give that moment uh just the, just give that moment a moment because let's take a breath let's take a breath for it. Let's take a breath because for these it. these two players, these two players who we have seen in sentences together many times over the last two years in so many different t- ways. Oh my God, Kelnick looks amazing. What a terrible trade. Oh my God, Kelnick looks terrible. Who cares? Oh my God. Like all these things leading to Jared Kelnick being on the Braves facing Edwin Diaz in this spot is so hilarious. Uh, By the way, also Jared Kelnick, who has barely played in the last two weeks. He has played his way out of being an option to the point where he was not even starting in this game against a right-handed pitcher. But he, I guess, gets the job done. (laughs) Okay, two things here. One, Orlando Arcia has been horrendous with runners in scoring position over the last... Like historically. Like bad. historically bad. Yes. And so Kelnick here, I would imagine Snit, Snitker was like, this is good karma. I'm bringing in Kelnick against Diaz. You know, yes, two yes, guys traded for, for sure. one another in a massive deal. Somewhere, Mets GM Brody Van Wagen in, <laughs> just cracking a beer and giggling to himself, taking in the show, mm-hmm. whatever. Bases end up getting loaded in a two-run game. Ozzy Albies, two outs, right on right, gets a hold of one off the base of the fence in left. The ball skips away. Every buddy scores, and the Atlanta Braves take a one-run lead. Truist Park was rocking. And that is where what I wanted to, to fixate on here. The roar of the crowd for that hit was like you just you only get that. At this time of year, as cliche as that sounds, like I have not heard that one time in <laughs> the regular season. Of course, there have been amazing regular season games and walk offs, but like it's there different. is something so familiar about that specific feeling it's... that that the crack and then just the realization of the crowd. It's not an Atlanta specific thing. It is it is a this kind of hit specific thing. And that's that's what it felt like. Every iconic sports moment Jordan has this in it where the the crowd is jumping <laughs> so much that the camera mm. shakes and mm, rattles yeah. and we got that on that hit and boy it's the same visceral feeling as when the air gets cold at the end of September and we know 
that the most magical baseball is upon us. The Braves finish that inning up eight, up seven to six, heading to the top of the ninth. And what mm. happens there? Well, oh. <laughs> so, okay. So, first of all, after that, you're like, and I, I've, I've made this point before, um, that oftentimes the go-ahead hit in the bottom of the eighth can be even more lit than the walk-off. Because the drama, especially for a, for now, both for the team that does it, but also even for a neutral observer, because then there's another chapter of the game. The game has not concluded, but the game has swung, and now you just have all these different feelings. You're like, oh my God, Diaz, but then you know that there's still a chance for redemption. It's the game is not over, even though it's swung at that last second. And so when they, now, but again, at this point, Iglesias has been burned, right? Normally at this spot, here comes Iglesias. He's been burned. So we go to Pierce Johnson. Pierce Johnson having a good season, right? Yep. But this is a this is a big spot for <laughs> Pierce Johnson. Big spot. Big spot. Gets, the, gets the first out. Starling Marte singles. And then here comes Francisco Lindor. And all of his uh <laughs> is he injured? I I mean, I he both Don't looks look. so injured and looks so <laughs> not injured. <laughs> So I don't really Uh, know what to make of Lindor's health status at this point, but the point I'll say this, I'll say this. He's performing, does not look comfortable. He does not look at peace. I agree. However, and yet yet the the results. Do you you know what else wasn't at peace? The baseball that Francisco Lindor hit over the wall for a go-ahead two run bomb on the first pitch. Sitting curveball, I guess. Pierce Johnson, I mean, throws a whole lot of those bad boys, doesn't he? Yeah. So <laughs> I know people are giving Gary uh, Cohen some some flack for saying on the call that Lindor got under one. <laughs> he did get under it. Technically, it's true. He did got under the but ball. That thirty five degree launch angle was just right, and the hang time that we got in this home run did make it all the more delicious. Because while yes. 107 off the bat at a 35 degree launch is usually a home run. It did feel like a, a bit of a wall scraper, right? <laughs> and and so, you see Michael oh, Harris man. creeping mm-hmm. and you're like, mm-hmm. that dude has taken balls back before. And for Harris specifically, when he robs a homer, he yeah. is like watching because yes. he's so like quick, he's like watching it and he's tracking it like a jungle cat. And so yep. when he jumps up slow, you like still think there's a chance he's going to make the play. And in Cohen's defense, the way he handled it was way better than the alternative, right? You do not want to be in a situation in this spot where you say, and Lindor crushes one and Ooh. there it goes. Ooh. At the no, wall. That's a lot worse than saying he got under it and then building back up to an that's, unbelievable go-ahead home run. Oh, it was so, so good. Mets dugout goes bonkers. <laughs> Truist Park, silent. And it is these moments, we love college baseball. This felt like a college baseball game in that oh moment where you have dudes running out of the dugout, you, the pitching is all out of whack, and it only got wilder and more collegian when Edwin Diaz Comes okay, back out exactly for the night. And so because then, as we mentioned, the chaos of taking the lead in the eighth, uh, what that means for, oh, wait, okay, who's closing this out for Atlanta, right? Then you're like, wait a minute, who's closing this out for the Mets? <laughs> like, um, where are we where are we going here? Is, are we getting my man Brazabon coming in for the no. appearance of his life? No, no, because Edwin Diaz, apparently, reportedly, after Lindor hit the home run, uh, went to Carlos Mendoza and was like, I'm staying in this game. Sorry, bro. I'm not leaving. Um, and Carlos Mendoza was like, whether no. it was, whether he no, had a not. better plan yes, or not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. <laughs> yes, I am. He, uh, he let him go back out there for Matt Olson. Now, again, Eli White was on deck after that. <laughs> because of the kind of configurations of the of the of the ridiculous sequencing of the game earlier, but Olson looming there and having Diaz go there to to face Olson after the inning he had just had 
was um, kind of horrifying. But Olsen pops out on the first pitch. White battles, dumps a single into center on the seventh pitch because that's baseball. And then he gets Loriano on. I mean, these sliders that Diaz was throwing in this ninth were just hellacious. I mean, when you see like these are just these are the sliders where the swings are. I think this is a fastball. Oh, nope. I missed this by eight inches. That was exactly what was happening. And then ultimately, former Met Travis Darno, who has tormented the Mets many times since he has departed Queens, comes up and uh, grounds out to who else? Francisco Lindor for the final out as the Mets clinch a postseason berth, leaving the Braves absolutely stunned. It was unforgettable. What a game. I mean, it was so out of the ordinary in so many ways with how the managers chose to use their bullpens with what was at stake. The dr- It was just superb drama and it felt real. It felt like a playoff game. However, it was not because there was another game to play. A game that the Braves needed to win in order to get into the playoffs. A game that if the Braves lost it, the Diamondbacks would get in. And about 25 minutes before the first pitch of that game, we got some legitimately shocking news. And that was that Chris Sale, who is likely to win the NL Cy Young this year, the Braves left-handed Whirlybird, was scratched with back spasms. And that Grant Holmes, Kenny Powers lookalike, a man with hair both long and wet, would be starting in his place. Grant Holmes, who threw yesterday, he threw 21 pitches and inning and two thirds yesterday, was going to get the start. And for that moment, there was a path, it seemed, for the Arizona Diamondbacks because you thought it was going to be Chris Sale. It was not Chris Sale. You saw the Braves had burned probably their four best high leverage relievers, definitely their three best guys in Jimenez, Mm -hmm. in Iglesias, in Johnson. And it's like, and bummer, and bummer. Could the Mets do this? Could they beat the Braves and put the Diamondbacks in? And the answer was no, was absolutely not. Uh, The Mets swung at everything under the sun. Grant Holmes dealt to his credit. He was perfect into the fifth. I I mean, this turned out to be unfortunately exactly what we feared. And the fact that the first game was so amazing is the saving grace for this bizarre baseball day that we just witnessed because the, the fact of the matter, this was not a matter of the brave, the Mets wanting to help the Braves and then some sort of, gentlemen's pact to split the doubleheader no this was entirely exclusively an a, a sensible logical act of self-preservation and that is why the Mets rolled out a B team lineup with a starter in Joey Lucchese who had appeared in the big leagues once this season back in May he got blasted against the Phillies in a spot start he was good and jo- and Joey Lucchese was fine right but it was very apparent as this game went on that that there was I mean, the only way the Mets were going to win is if they accidentally hit a home run like that's genuinely how I feel. Um, and and it was one nothing for a lot of this game. And so that was, I guess, in play. But unfortunately for Arizona, the bizarre sequencing of all of this over the last week led us to this situation, which we fully anticipated when we talked uh, 24 hours ago. And I think the fact that it was the Mets who had won the first game and not the Braves is also not insignificant as the Mets were further had the additional incentive of not changing who their eventual opponent was going to be. Had Atlanta won their first game, they knew they were going to San Diego after the game no matter what. And so they also would have rolled out a B team and Grant Holmes maybe would have gone CG (laughs) instead of four innings or whoever else they had planned. Maybe they would have called someone up uh, to start. Um, I don't think it's an accident that that the Mets also, you know, looked at the potential opponents yeah, ahead and, and said, "Listen, this is an." But but it wasn't even about that. The, the most important thing is the Mets had no incentive to to give it their all in the second game. To they had to stay healthy. Obviously, Lindor wasn't going to play. They weren't going to use any of their pitchers. They'd already blown through all their bullpen over these last couple of games. Also, 
And so this is what we were left with, which was which was a yeah. really crappy baseball game to um, allow Atlanta into the postseason. Now, the most gen- the way I'm looking at it is that Atlanta earned their way into the postseason this past weekend. Yes. And over the past. Absolutely. Weeks, right. So it's not that Atlanta doesn't deserve it, but the way that this day unfolded made it all look very silly and it just kind of sucked by the end. The, it was farce adjacent. And it to was. be clear, I'm not saying we're not saying that the Mets were like, let's lose time to lose. No. It's no. that it- they were not as locked in as you would be for a normal game because their incentives were creating subconscious decisions for them not to do normal baseball activities. Here's an example. Brandon Nimmo, who runs everywhere, home runs, walks to the store. Hit by pitch. He does everything, right? He does not walk his dog, okay? <laughs> he runs his dog. Brandon Nimmo, in the ninth inning with a runner on first and nobody out, hits a ground ball and takes his sweet time getting down the line. His normal sprint speed, I think, is around like 28 feet per second. I think this was like a 26.5, right? Which sounds insignificant, but like that's a pretty (laughs) meaningful gap. Again, you understand why. It's totally fine. We're not saying the Braves did not earn it. They earned it this last week, but the spectacle of it all was undeniably bizarre. Briefly, on the Arizona Diamondbacks, who Uh, this played out exactly how we thought it was going to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Stinks for them. I feel for them. Mm -hmm. It sucks. If they hadn't blown an 8-0 to lead last Sunday, they would have been in the playoffs. Yeah. Well, and it's the same way that while the sequencing made it feel like it was all about today, that's not the reality. And sure, you could play that game with a lot of teams. Or you go back, oh, if they just had this one win. Oh, if they just hadn't done this. Especially over these last few weeks. They And Tori Lavelle said this yesterday. He said, listen, we we made our bed here. So they can hope for the best uh, for what happened today. But they played themselves into a situation where they had to cross their fingers in this bizarre scenario. And unfortunately, they uh, team that won 89 games and had a good season. They came up short because their pitching was just so bad, um, particularly in the second half, that uh, it it just wasn't good enough to get into what turned out to be a very, very competitive nationally wildcard race. All in all, a day was had. (laughs) A day that I will remember for a long time. That is for sure. Um, Okay. I, I have a lot of Chris Sale thoughts, but I guess we can push those to our preview for the Braves and Padres. So Let's we'll, we'll, we're going to circle back on Chris Sale uh, a little bit later on when we preview uh, the Brewers and the Mets, as well as the Padres and the Braves. Now, before we take a break, Jake, as you just said, this is a day we'll remember for a long time. Um, Most of that was the two baseball games we watched. One of them was amazing and one of them was less amazing, but memorable in its own way. Uh, the other was a a mountain of of baseball news, which we were trying to also process over the course of this. This day. is why we usually don't have games on this day, because <laughs> teams are doing their boy. We didn't have a good year press conferences, and there's often a lot of news in those press conferences. Per example, Buster Posey is now running the Giants. Yes, franchise icon. Future Hall of Fame catcher Buster Posey is, as of today, the president of baseball operations of the San Francisco Giants, replacing Farhan Zaidi, who made just one postseason appearance in his six years at the helm. Now, Posey was involved with the team before this date. He was, I believe, the president of the board or on the board. He had significant sway, but now he has significant sway officially. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, worthy of a much longer conversation than we are going to do now. I think when we arrive at the offseason and we start kind of digging into some of the team's plans this winter, we should really circle back and dig into what this means. Um, But this is a stunner. This is just there had been some interesting reporting about Buster Posey being involved in the Matt Chapman extension and how he had sort of really pushed for that and made that happen. That that made clear that Posey had really been getting hands on with baseball operations. But 
everything about this is is fascinating. And the Giants entering any offseason are, are certainly an interesting character uh, now even more so. So we will we will keep an eye on that. Again, I, I wish we had more time to, to dig into this. Um, so we've already gotten some emails about it. And yes, by the way, Buster Pobozy is amazing. He is our newest Pobo. And Pobozy. I love that for him. Uh, so that's great. Uh, that's the nickname I'm, I'm good with. But I, again, this is there's a lot to process with this one, and w- yep. we will circle back to it uh, in November for sure. In other Pobo news, a good day for the Jewish people as <laughs> Chaim Bloom, former uh, sorry yeah. chief baseball officer for the Boston Red Sox and former GM of the Tampa Bay Rays, it was announced that he will be the president of baseball operations for the St. Louis Cardinals after next season. Chaim Bloom is already in the Cardinals front office. The Cardinals current Pobo, John Moziliak, it is was public that he was going to step down after next season. Chaim is officially the successor. And yes, Chaim is a member of the community, believe it or not. Yes, uh, which is why we're saying Chaim and not Chaim. Uh, the main thing to know, to know about this. Great way to know. <laughs> the, main, the main note takeaway here is particularly in relation to some great reporting from Katie Wu and The Athletic about how the Cardinals, after the worst two back-to-back seasons we've seen from them in decades, are really trying to change how they do things internally, particularly when it comes to player development, particularly when it comes to just a lot of the bones of the of the operation. And they have tabbed, they clearly identified Bloom as someone that can help in those efforts before this point. And that's why he had been brought in to kind of survey how things were were functioning or not functioning. And now he will be tasked with kind of restoring this previously, you know, reliably great franchise that has fallen behind in in kind of a shocking way. And they have a a lot of very difficult decisions to make this winter. They're already reporting that they will not be retaining free agent Paul Goldschmidt. So that is certainly interesting. But, you know, there there's some good things on this roster, but there's certainly a lot of work to do. And and Bloom will clearly be a part of this over the next year and then and then certainly beyond. And then before we take a break, we must mention that Pete Rose died. Pete Rose, who has the most hits in MLB games uh, during his career for many, is the hit king. Passed away, I believe, at the age of 83. Pete Rose, uh, calling him a complicated figure, I think uh, almost undersells the level of transgressions that he had throughout his career. Yes, he will be remembered by many as Charlie Hustle, as someone who played the game hard, who played the game for a very long time. Pete Rose is not someone who I look upon fondly with any a delight or memories that is based upon his various misdeeds off the diamond. Now that does include uh, the gambling scandal in which he was tied up in at the end of his career. While he was, the, I believe the player manager uh, of the Cincinnati Reds. He might've just been the manager at the time. And I'm just going to read a quote. Uh, this, <laughs> this is kind of how I feel about that particular thing. Manfred, this is in 2017 when Rose uh, applied for reinstatement. Manfred said that Rose did not have a, quote, mature understanding of his wrongful conduct and the damage it had done to the game. So I understand that there's a lot of interesting conversations to be had about Pete Rose and gambling and where sports are at now, yada, yada, still. Also, another reason that I do not think well of Pete Rose is this headline from the New York Times from 2022. Pete Rose dismisses questions about sexual misconduct. After attending an on-field celebration of the 1980 Phillies, Rose refused to answer questions about allegations from a 2017 lawsuit saying, quote, it was 55 years ago, babe. Look, thoughts are with his family. I don't know his family. I did not know Pete personally. It seems that there are many people around the game, around the baseball world who knew Pete Rose well and liked Pete Rose, people who I know and, and like. But this is not someone who I think their legacy can be tidied off and hoisted aloft as purely good. Mm -hmm. Just because someone passes away, as sad as that may be, does not make now a proper opportunity to whitewash the things that someone may or may not have done. And while I understand that may come across as a little bit 
crass or unforgiving or heartless on my part. That is just how I am feeling about this particular thing at this particular time, uh, given that I've had like an hour <laughs> to think about it on a day where there are 55 other things going on. And again, we could have a whole podcast on Pete Rose. We could have had a whole podcast on Chaim Bloom or Farhan Zaidi. It's September 30th. This is all we got for you. Yeah. The only, the only other, the only two things I would add, obviously, this is someone whose career and the highs and lows of his life is, means something very different to many different people, depending on their generation, depending on who, you know, a lot of different things. But I think that the Manfred quote that you gave and that sentiment, I think clearly applies in many respects. The lack of mature understanding after many years for many transgressions with which he was involved is enough to, I think, deservedly and understandably sway the court of public opinion uh, against his favor for a lot of people, particularly ones that have no reason to feel in any sort of way yeah. positively associated with him in the way that we as, you know, two 29 year olds, why would we really care yeah. to, you know, stand up for this person? And baseball will forgive people who wrong. But Rose was ostracized to such a point that it is pretty clear to me that he went above and beyond in some form or fashion. May those who knew him and loved him find peace in the next few days. All right, Jordan, let's take a break. And when we return, we will dig our teeth into the National League side of the playoff field. And welcome back to Baseball Barbecue's Jake Mintz, Jordan Schusterman. Before we begin previewing Brewers Mets, I'm going to read an email that we received. Okay. This email is from Matthew. Matthew says, boys, uh, first off, I need to correct Jake's pronunciation of Tarek Skubal, since it's a name he will keep saying. Uh, it rhymes with Derek. Here is him saying it. Uh, that's on me. We care about pronunciations. It is not Tarek. It is not Tarek. It is Tarek, as in Derek. It is definitely not Tariq. Definitely not Tariq, <laughs> which I have yes. not said. No, you clear. have not, but I still hear people say. But anyway, Ma what, what else Matthew goes Matthew on. To say? He goes, Jake, as for your other important question, Jake's narrative machine noise did sound like a train. <laughs> chugga chugga can only be a train. If you want the narrative machine to be a Manchester industrial contraption, I think it should go cha-chunk, cha-chunk, cha-chunk. Cheers and enjoy the postseason, Matt. Thank you, Matt. And so on that note, I will say cha-chunk, cha-chunk, cha-chunk. I sound like um, Big Justice <sighs> and his dad. <laughs> <laughs> Double chocolate, cha-chunk. <sighs> the narrative machine is booted up. Brewers, Mets, a rematch of this past weekend in an oh, NL Wild showdown. Yes. Oh, what a weird thing. So. Again, I don't know if it would have been more weird had there was a scenario where they avoided the doubleheader and they had just stayed in Milwaukee and just played again two days later. Now, with his detour to Atlanta to save their season and extend their season, the Mets returned to Milwaukee where they just <laughs> left. And this was something that I think we, I don't know who we were talking to about this, but like, do you think any Mets, like, first of all, do you think they're staying in the same hotel? Second of all, like, do you think they left anything in Milwaukee as a sign of confidence? Like, I'll be back. We'll be back. Well, no, because if they had won both <laughs> games, they would have gone to oh, San Diego. Sure. Well, we so know they were not intent on winning both games. So yeah. I feel like they probably knew if they were going to win, they were going to be back in Milwaukee. And, and now they are. One of the things that the narrative machine is spitting out, Jordan, is that these two teams faced off in the first weekend of the year. So that is bizarre. You play a team the first weekend and the last weekend of the entire season. And in that first weekend, remember, we had some spice. We had a yes. slide from Reese Hoskins on Jeff McNeil that resulted in McNeil yelling at Hoskins and Hoskins yelling at McNeil. And these two teams got into it. Johan Ramirez, who at the time was a Met, <laughs> threw behind someone and it got really testy. The Brewers swept the Mets in Queens 
to put them at 0-3, and, and here they are, showing up in the October. We don't have Gary Cohen's from 0-5 to OMG call without the Brewers kicking their ass to open the season. I mean, this was a, a key contributor here, and we know that in those games when the Mets, again, remember they had like lost Sanga very close to opening day. The vibes were not awesome. Now, Jeff McNeil, no longer a, a character on this Mets team. Uh, not just Hoskins, no longer a character, yeah. Jordan. Not around. Not around, you know, right? Often, I was going to say, I haven't even noticed him. He has not been around. Like, I would have assumed that a player of McNeil's stature and status would have resulted in him hanging around a really competitive, exciting team. I have not seen him personally. But, but maybe, I assume he's in maybe Florida. he's there, but I I have not seen him. Um, I went he... to seven Mets home games in a row and was in the clubhouse okay. every day, and I did not so, see Jeff McNeil. Thank you. I was referring to just like watching on TV the last few days. That is very helpful context. Um, he had a season ending. Uh, he had wrist, a wrist fracture, so he's out for the season. So he's not around, but Reese Hoskins still is, and Reese Dude. Hoskins is one of the many oh. compelling characters in this series. The Mets should bring McNeil to Milwaukee just to have him like piss off the Brewers, even though they <laughs> haven't seen him in forever. But 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 honestly, Reese against the the Mets is it's farther down the narrative machine for me. Um, much more compelling, I would say, is David Stearns with his <laughs> much larger payroll against his old friends in Milwaukee. Now, the funniest part about this is that because of the sequence of all of this, the Mets are the team showing up as the upstart underdogs <laughs> against yeah. Milwaukee, which is just a hilarious, you know, turn of turn of uh, of roles. Um, but at the end of the day, the David Stearns against the Brewers is still ultra oh, compelling. Because, you know, David Stearns, given the job as president of baseball operations in Queens before this season, a guy who Steve Cohen, the Mets owner, had his eyes on for some time, his fingerprints are all over this Mets team already just because of how many moves he made to get them to where they are, to improve the roster on the fringes, to put the Mets in this position. And of course, his fingerprints are all over the Brewers roster. He was running that team for a very, very long time. The one other narrative machine I got to spit out for you <laughs> is the McGill Bowl. Ty Lore McGill, who threw game one on Monday of the doubleheader, is almost certainly not on the wildcard roster. However, his brother, Trevor just, I guess that's just Trevor. Trevor McGill <laughs> is a setup man for the Milwaukee Brewers. And so we have, yes. we got brothers showing up. However, this is not what, what appears to be the McGill mother was hoping for. I believe this is who this is uh, at Jules McGill, Julie McGill, AKA Mama McGill. I'm assuming that is the McGill's mother and not one of their wives. Um, she tweeted after the Mets won the first game that Tyler McGill started. She tweeted, OK, now we need to win game two. I don't want my boys eliminating each other. We want to see Mets in San Diego. Uh, sorry, Mama McGill. You were the only one <laughs> involved with the New York Mets rooting for that, as we will now see both of these McGill brothers who have emerged as two very, very important pitchers for both of their teams. Now, it seems unlikely we will be seeing Ty Lore pitching uh, in this wildcard series after the performance he just gave us on Monday. However, Trevor um, could certainly play an important role as he is one of the key members of this Milwaukee bullpen that is once again uh, one of the best in baseball. Trevor McGill. All right, who has the better offense? I think it's the Mets, and it's not particularly close. If you run the clock back to the beginning of June when the Mets started being these Mets. They have one of the best offenses in baseball, and Milwaukee is just simply regular good. Uh, and I think right now I would take New York over Milwaukee just pretty right. Like, yes, not by a ton and not by a little. Yeah, I think, again, I, I mean, I can't dispute that the numbers do say that over these last few months that it has not been as productive of a group for Milwaukee, but I think they still have a good amount of star power. And, and on the whole, their offensive ranks are still fairly comfortably in the top part of the league. 
And I think what the Brewers have now, they, they do have real, real star power still in the mix here, right? They have one of the best catchers in baseball in Contreras. They have, I mean, one of the best shortstops in the league and in Willie Adamas having a career year. Jackson Churio, 20 year old phenom has been getting better with, with each passing month. And they do a lot else very well. They run the bases extremely well. They play very, very, very good defense. And so the edge on the position player side of things is, is going to probably be more about kind of the sum of the parts more than just strictly the offense. Because to your point, yeah, the offense, of, you know, the slugging potential of New York when it's all clicking and it's kind of fluctuated who we've seen contribute. We've seen, you know, the older veterans showing up big with but like Nimmo didn't finish strong really in September. I know he had that big, big swing today. But then you've had these younger guys show up with Vientos, right? And Alvarez have looked better recently. And then you have these random strange collection of veterans like, of course, the Glacier. Yes, J.D. Martinez has been horrific for the last month, and I have no idea how much we can really expect from him. I think this is a closer gap. I, I guess I lean the Mets slightly, but I don't know. This is closer to a toss-up for me based on how inconsistent some of their veteran hitters have been recently. Uh, Jose Iglesias got hits in both of the heads of the doubleheader, and so Iglesias he now has, has a 22-game hit unreal. streak. Unreal. He's hitting like 350, right? I mean, he's been yeah. he's been sensational. So I think it's closer, but I, I I understand what you're going for with New York, but I I think it's pretty close. Starting pitching, I think it's the Mets. Now we should talk about this a little bit more. In game one, again, who the hell knows for either of these teams? I don't believe either team has announced starters as of right now. Uh, I yeah, I'm pretty sure Peralta has been announced. Um and we're assuming Severino because the Mets, they didn't need to use Severino. and He did not pitch this past yes. week. And we assume it'll be Severino and Peralta in game one. That's a wash. Now, af after that, yeah, I think that's pretty even. I think with how Severino has thrown recently, I think Peralta is the kind of pitcher, especially this year. We're always waiting for him to take that next step into like being just like bona fide signing candidate. That didn't quite happen this year, even though he was still generally pretty good. Um, but it's what happens after that. You know, Manaya had been throwing so well for the Mets down the stretch. He did not look great against the Brewers on Friday. So I assume he would still be getting the ball in that second game, but maybe the Mets pivot. I don't really know what direction they could go. Again, we also saw David Peterson just pitch. So beyond that, we were talking about Quintana. We're talking about, are we still talking about Senga? I don't think no. so. Um, no. But yeah, it's going to be a little bit messy at the same time. The Brewers have kind of had this makeshift rotation all year. They traded for Frankie Montas. He hasn't been amazing. Tobias Myers has been sneaked, and Colin Ray have both been very reliable in getting through the 162 game grind. Very important for their division winning, you know, ways. However, are they guys you're ecstatic to hand the ball to in a postseason game? Probably not. Uh, but maybe they could prove us wrong as they have pretty much all season. So Montas was generally pretty good for them over a couple of starts, had a big stinker. He started the game that Arizona bungled against the mm. Brewers where they went up eight mm -hmm. to zero. I think he'll probably start game two and the game three will be Tobias Myers. Now, the reason that the Brewers have a good shot in the series is that their bullpen is better and it's not even really yep. that close. Milwaukee's bullpen is not quite as good as Cleveland's, but they use it in a similar way close. where yep. the game is shorter. Right. Their starters are only going to go four or five innings. Then they're going to hand the ball off to their dominant relievers. Yeah. And that is that is going to be the key here. And we should also mention Aaron Savali is another name to maybe keep an eye on to potentially yeah. get a start later in the series. Obviously, they, they acquired him midseason. But yeah, this bullpen. Now, it was already doing its job for a lot of the first few months. But since it got Devin Williams back, this is this is, I think, honestly, I would say a, a relatively under discussed storyline in the whole league, considering Milwaukee's importance here as as the host of this wildcard series, is that Devin Williams looks as good as ever. Uh, you know, he missed the first few months with a back injury, and he has been incredible. And that's especially important because while the Brewers bullpen has been very good, most of them are not racking up strikeouts. It's a lot of funky looks and kind of just pitches that are keeping guys off balance. You know, McGill throws hard and Jared Koenig throws hard, but like the Pionks and Ashby. Hobie Milners of the world. Ashby, Ashby's been pretty nasty in terms of, you know, racking up some strikeouts. Another lefty who's really come on late. But Williams is, is the swing and miss guy, and obviously he's the closer. So to your point, like Cleveland, it's just going to be about how short can they make these games. Yeah. And in a short series, they are in a good position to do that. And even more importantly, not just the raw talent, they're also rested as the Mets have, well, that's the thing. I mean, that's the thing. I don't that's think Edwin Diaz oh, is pitching but, tomorrow. <laughs> that's my point. What bullpen would you rather have? 
the one whose a hundred million dollar closer didn't throw forty pitches the day before you play. Whoa! And pitched the day before that. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> like, yeah. So that's not that complicated. But even fully rested, I think we'd be leaning Milwaukee here. All right. Season series. We touched on it. They played five minutes ago. They played six months ago. I don't think we can learn anything from either of those if we're being real. Um, it will be interesting to see how the Mets pitchers f- kind of change their approaches against the Brewers maybe this time through. X Factors. Edwin Diaz. How's he feeling? Not only how's he feeling, how are the Mets feeling, right? Does the situation today with the doubleheader impact them at all in an obvious way tomorrow? We will see. I don't know. If they come out sluggish and sleepy, I'd be like, yep, that's totally fine. <laughs> and then on the Brewers Tot- side, yeah. on the Brewers side, for me, it's all about Willie Adamas, who at points this season has looked like a star. He will be reaching free agency this year. I think he could get $200 million as a very good defensive shortstop who is still relatively young, who hits for a lot of power. In September, he lost a little bit of that, you know, ceiling in his game he wasn't quite as dynamic does he show up in these big moments when this team calls upon him i think that is a big 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 x factor here this winter he will take dansby swanson's contract and be like that's the floor and that is an extremely reasonable stance to take um willie is is an incredible player and and person and and such a such a fun character on this brewers team i think yeah, I mean, after what happened to the Brewers last year, <laughs> I just, I don't know. As we as we transition to the picks here, I'm picking the Mets here. Um, not really due to any sort of logic, but I guess that's kind of the theme of the Mets season. And I'm riding the logic of the Mets in the same way that with the with the Rangers last year, it was just like, oh, God, what a disaster. They have to go. They bungled this, so they have to go play this extremely inconvenient game And if they're going to go on this run. But maybe that's just going to keep the sparks going. Maybe that amplifies the magic for the Mets, at least for one more round. And I just kind of feel like the Mets are going to find a way to win two more games here. Is that extremely disrespectful to this Milwaukee team? Probably. I really love what Milwaukee has built. And I think that like it's it's totally underestimating them because this is the team with the third best run differential in baseball in the regular season, right? Behind only uh the Dodgers and the Yankees or and the Phillies. Um and so like that's that's not a small thing. And I I should not be underselling that, but I will ride this this ridiculous Mets wave uh for at least a little bit longer. Sorry, Dodgers and Yankees, uh two run differentials ahead of them. So the Brewers better run differential than the Phillies. Okay? Like this is a great team and shame on me for doubting them. I will pick them. I will take the Brewers. I think they're just good. Like, I just think they're really good, and I think that'll <laughs> show right. up. Yeah, that's fair. That's totally I think valid. Not, yeah. I think not having Diaz tomorrow yeah. Yeah. is big, and then having a reduced version of Diaz, like yeah. 60 pitches in two yeah. days with one day of rest, like, I think that's a big deal. Uh, yeah. Who throws that's at totally, the first pitches? Totally yeah. Who throws at the first pitches? Jeff McNeil. Uh <laughs> Christian Yelich should throw one out. Yelich Herb. feels like a, a good one. Um, okay. He's hurt. Giannis obviously. was just there like two days ago, so I don't know if he'll be there again. Giannis um, should throw one out. Euchre, yeah. Bob Euchre, let him throw one out. Oh, it's, I mean, yeah. I got one more. Again. You want to laugh? You want to laugh? Yeah, please. The person who should throw it out is Craig Council, former <laughs> Brewers manager. And the person who should throw it out next to him <laughs> is the guy who spray painted ass on the sign of Craig Council at his high school. He, he should, should catch, catch it. it. It's like a reconciliation thing. Like we're in the this. playoffs. You're not. We forgive you. You're still ass. Yeah. Come Perfect. throw the first pitch. That is hilarious. Uh, all right. Well, that is the Brewers and the Mets. Uh, let us know what we missed on that one. We're going to take a quick break. And when we return, we will preview the Padres. And the Atlanta Braves, who, yes, they are in the postseason as well. We'll be right back. Cha-chunk, cha-chunk, cha-chunk. Let's boot up that narrative machine one last time for this round. Oh, no, Jordan. There's a wildcat strike due to poor labor practices here in Manchester in the industrial age. And it seems that the narrative machine has run out of gas because I, Mm. I don't really have anything for this one. 
Yeah. What what is the the connection? We've had so many of these series we've already talked about with these overlapping, you know, these links. Oh, we got Hinch and the and the Astros. Oh, we got Stearns and the and the Brewers, all these things, and maybe we'll get more, but but Padres Braves is I mean, there's a lot of famous cool baseball players that are gonna be playing against each other. But in terms of the yeah. links between the two teams, I I guess Max Freed would be one um, to mention, right? Okay, that seems like a decent one. Max Freed, who was who was drafted by the Padres, but has of course spent his whole career with Atlanta, and is now approaching free agency. That one seems like uh, a piece of overlap. Is I guess Dylan Cease is from Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, i don't know if he grew up a braves fan but maybe that's something what else you got the justin upton trade <laughs> i guess is that who you're nominated to throw out a first pitch justin upton first pitch uh most war for these teams combined is ryan kleska this is all to say okay. that besides the 1998 nlcs which i don't know anything doesn't about, mean much to us yeah uh I don't really have anything spicy or saucy. And guess what? That's fine because these teams are both good enough to carry a series on their own. How'd they get here? You know, we talked about the Braves earlier. Padres challenged for the division late against the Dodgers. Didn't have quite enough juice. Here they are facing up against Atlanta. Who has the better offense in your mind, Mr. Schusterman? San Diego. And I don't think this one is particularly close. With all of the injuries that Atlanta has sustained, of course, losing Acuna, losing Riley, missing Albies for a lot of this season, the Braves offense now is very like, hopefully we hit some home runs. That is generally their plan. Of course, Albies kind of brings a little bit more element to that, but there's really no impact on the bases whatsoever. And the plate discipline is not awesome. They're striking out a good a bit. And it's just kind of we got Matt Olson and Marcelo Zuna and we can run into one every once in a while. Again, these are really good hitters. It's not like they're incapable of, of, of winning some postseason games here. But compared to a Padres offense that is just such a balanced and fun group, a team that has the lowest strikeout rate in baseball. But and yes, Luis Arise has a big part in that. But it's not like this team's a bunch of slap hitters either. Right. I mean, this team with the highest contact rate in baseball, the highest batting average and lowest strikeout rate also can can hit dingers when they need to. And so to kind of have that balance uh, of power, but with contact in the lineup uh, with right, left as well with a switch hitter like Profar is is really cool. And I just think especially since Tatis got back, this has just been an, an incredibly impressive group. And uh, I'm a big fan of what this this offense is capable of. Better starting pitching. So this is where we should talk about Chris Sale. <sighs> yeah. Now, I think this would have been a very fun conversation had Chris Sale not been scratched and is reportedly not going to be available. Had Reynaldo Lopez not thrown six innings on Saturday and then come in relief again on Monday. If we were talking about a fully healthy version of this Brave staff, which we have generally seen this year after Spencer Schreider got hurt, you know, Lopez missed some time, this would be compelling argument. However, the Padres are in very, very good shape here, and the reporting is that uh, we are going to see a very interesting uh, assortment of pitchers here. As we mentioned, we are not going to see Chris Sale. I don't think we're going to see Max Freed on tomorrow. Like The Braves have so many questions about who they're even going to have available. I believe San Diego has announced that it will be uh, Michael King in game one and then Joe Musgrove in game two and Dylan Cease in game three, which is an interesting deployment. But and Darvish, I guess, will be available out of the bullpen. But the fact oh that they have God. those four. Yeah. Is it going to be Bryce Elder? I mean, it might or have to Ian be I mean, Anderson or Drew Hackenberg. Like, are we going to get or a debut? Like, I, I don't Dylan really Dodd. know what it, Atlanta's situation is here. Let's also just like, again. The fact that Sale got scratched, like this is a, a it's just a shocking turn of events, right? Maybe we should have been paying attention to the fact that his velo was three miles an hour down the last time he started 10 days ago. And we just assumed, oh, they're saving him, they're saving him, they're saving him, they're saving him. And I don't know if Alex Anthopoulos is lying to us when they said that this just popped up, but it's at least a data point to consider. And man, when Anthopoulos 
popped in there after this first game and was like, uh, Chris Sale's not going to start. What a moment that was. A tweet from Mark Bowman, the Braves beat writer for MLB.com and kind of one of my favorite people on, on planet Earth. Uh, <laughs> Bo that. says, Ian Anderson, AJ smith Shaver, and Bryce Elder are the top candidates to start game one of the wild cards here against the Padres. Anderson has some of the best postseason numbers of all time, but hasn't pitched in the majors <laughs> since 2022. <laughs> <laughs> that is an incredible sentence. Now, again, if you're wondering, hey, what about Charlie Morton? Well, he just pitched on Sunday, and that did not go especially well. Um, but I mean, and then Freed threw on Saturday, correct? Or Freed, uh, Freed threw on Friday. So Freed will, in theory, be available at some point in this series. But Freed will pitch on Wednesday. That, yeah, Freed, Freed will start will game on two on Wednesday. Okay? But, but Sunday th- is just. Whew. Just one second. Game three. On Thursday, will almost certainly be Reynaldo Lopez. Him pitching today was something of a bullpen. It was like using his bullpen as pitching in the game. He will pitch on Thursday. I'm pretty confident in that. I would start Ian Anderson in game one. Just screw it, right? I think they'll again, probably they go with can't... Smith Shaver if they think he's an option because he's the most dynamic raw stuff. I do not think you could start Bryce Elder, right? I just, the Padres obliterated him earlier in the year. I just think that's a bad idea. But right now, I think you have to give the starting pitching edge to San Diego with Dylan Cease, Joe Musgrove, Yu Darvish, Michael King over the Braves. Easily, if of course. Everyone was not rested close. and it was lined up. I would give the Braves the advantage, but that's not the case right now. Better bullpen, also San Diego, particularly because of what the Braves just had to do. Rice Iglesias, their closer, pitched in both of the games today. San Diego went out at the deadline and traded for two elite relievers in Jason Adam and Tanner Scott. They already had two very good relievers in Jeremiah Estrada and Robert Suarez, who we'll talk about in a bit. And so I think you just have to say San Diego's bullpen is better. Yeah, and it's also the reason why, like, I mean, how Snicker chooses to manage this first game, right? Because, you know, we see teams in a bind saying, oh, who are we going to start? And then Generally, you just have relievers in the postseason that you just you just bullpen it. We've seen plenty of teams do that successfully, like Arizona winning multiple postseason games last year with a bullpen that we didn't actually think was that good. Because of how these last few days have gone, Atlanta does not necessarily have that luxury. So I am fascinated, not just with who they start. It's possible whoever they start gets blasted and, and you know, they coast and they just kind of accept that they're going to lose. But in a close game, what relievers is Snicker going to turn to to try and keep it close or try and hold a lead after what they've had to do over these last couple of days? Season series, Padres took three out of four in mid-May in Atlanta. Braves took two out of three in mid-July in San Diego. Sale was great both of those times. Doesn't look like that's going to matter. Cease punched out 11 against the Braves in June. X-Factors. Uh, I would have said Chris Sale and his back, but now I'm going to say whomever the heck starts game one on the mound for the Atlanta Braves. Like, if that person can deliver four innings, two runs, phenomenal stuff. Incredible. Give them. I the mean, this would heart. just be the ultimate, they stole this game. If the Braves can win on Tuesday, it, it will really be, it, it, no matter how it goes, like there's no scenario. I, I'm trying to imagine what would have to happen where I would be like, oh yeah, of course the Braves won that game. <laughs> like, I would run so back. So much is going to have to go right that we're not expecting. They should run Grant Holmes back. Just screw it. Just <laughs> they might. let him throw again. <laughs> they might, man. They might. Uh, so, other X factors anyway, for yeah. me. Ozzy Albies. What is he? He looked great today in that first game with two huge hits. He has looked really rough. Since he's gotten back from his hand injury, hitting right on right, I understand he's a better hitter righty. It's a really difficult adjustment to make. What he gives them will really be important considering how much this lineup struggles relatively against right-handed pitching. The Braves obliterate lefties. Like, one of the best lineups in baseball is against lefties. The Padres have four right. They won't be facing any. So, yeah. <laughs> sorry. And then... Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe that helps in your late inning matchups against Tanner Scott. Uh, but otherwise I, that is not going to be the situation for them. And then Robert Suarez, the Padres closer who was outstanding for the one. first half. Yeah. And then was really searching for it down the stretch had that really rough performance in the game where they clinched, where they got the triple play. 
and then in his last outing of the year was okay, but like had a wonky pitch mix where he threw a ton of changeups, right? Like whatever. I don't know what Ro- Robert Suarez is right now. And it'll be fascinating to see if they stick with him for the ninth in big spots. Right. Particularly because they have assembled so many great relievers around him. And so Mike Schilt's commitment to Suarez at the end of the game, when he in theory has other alternatives, it's a little it's a it's it's one of those great conundrums where it's like on one hand it feels a little late to make that switch. On the other hand, these are the most important games of the season. So you don't want to be a little late making a change that maybe you should make. I imagine he will still have the ninth inning in the situation that that arrives um, in the in the coming days if, if if it gets to that. But this San Diego bullpen, like this pitching staff, is just simply really really good. And and yes, the bigger names that were acquired we know about, but man, like what a season for Adrian Morahone! What a season for Brian Hoeing, who they also got from the Marlins in that deal, right? I mean, Wandy Peralta has has still been an important Yuki Matsui, who we've we've barely talked about, has has given them a lot of important innings. So. All of these guys have been really helpful for them. And that's why I, again, like I just look at this Padres team and I, I think besides the Phillies, I think it's the most balanced roster in the postseason. I, I really do feel that way. I, I don't know how, just how far they're going to go. Um, we can get to picks here in a second, but I, I just really like uh, what San Diego has going for them. Who throws out the first pitches? Juan Soto. <laughs> Bob Melvin. Yeah. Are the Yankees working out tomorrow? <laughs> get Soto out there. Um, any funny Braves? I mean, they should have Grant Holmes throughout the first pitch just to honor him <laughs> for his performance, like an American hero. I like you know who's not throwing Upton out the idea. first pitch. You know who's not throwing out the first pitch? Chris Sale. No, maybe with his right hand. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, the Padres have had. I mean, listen. Another, of course, big part of the the Padres season is is of course Peter Seidler, right? Who who passed away, um, before the season and. I mean, just everything about <laughs> Seidler's impact on this entire franchise, how this city has responded to this team, certainly before he passed away, but especially this season is so cool. And while they haven't been able, you know, they weren't quite able to chase down the Dodgers. I am so glad we will be watching postseason games uh, at Petco Park here coming up. I am so excited for that crowd to to get to experience that again. Of course, they they showed up when when they were there a couple years ago. But this team really feels like a, a group that that everyone involved just really believes in. And so I'm excited to see them them have that opportunity and, and for Atlanta to go in and and again, they they will be severe underdogs and and they will try and they are gonna really be against uh be against it here. Um and so we'll we'll see if they can manage it. But I'm I'm taking the Padres here pretty comfortably. And uh I don't know if it'll don't think it's gonna be the first time I'm gonna be picking them. Braves in three. All right. I will take the Padres in two. I think they will handle it. Sorry, Max Freed. It's okay. You are about to be very, very rich in just a matter of months. Uh, all right, Jake. There it is. Enough. Enough. We podcasted. We will shut I up so it. our wonderful producer, Andrew Hartz, can get this into your ear holes as soon as possible. And Jake can go eat dinner in Baltimore. The postseason. Starts on Tuesday. Need I say more? Email us, baseballbarbacast at gmail.com, B-A-R-B-Cast. Thank you, Andrew Hartz. Thank you all for listening. And we will talk to you all very, very, very soon. Exactly when? To be determined. Goodbye.